Hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show, episode number 180, with me, your host, Agostino Zinga. How the hell are you doing? Hope you guys are fine, well rested, well hydrated, and all that malarkey. I'm feeling good, I'm feeling fresh, and I'm feeling ready to go to communicate via the medium of podcasting and YouTube videos with you, my lovely audience. <sighs> I feel tired. I feel exhausted. Um, my body's in a slight bit of pain. My ankles are a little bit, you know, um, a little bit swollen. My toes are a little bit sensitive. And if you're wondering why, it's because I've just came back from a three mile run this morning. Um, I woke up a little bit later than I do usually. Woke up about seven and headed out about, about half seven. Went for a quick little run, come back, and now here I am recording this podcast before I get to work. Um, and yeah, my body's feeling a little bit sensitive and stuff. And um, I think I mentioned I mentioned this ad nauseum on here, but God Almighty, running, 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 running outside on the pavement on concrete is extremely difficult and much more difficult, or you know, a lot harder to do than it is to go to the gym. I guarantee it, man. It's just you can't compare the two things because I don't know while I was running today, I ran past this um uh this I think it's like an army barracks. It's just around the corner from where I live. It's sort of like a little army base where they, I think they trained the uh, I forgot what they called the cadets, right? Cadets barracks, cadets base, whatever. I'm sure that's the place right when you first go in when you're young and stuff. So um I w- ran past there and they've got like a little unit outside where they train sometimes inside this kind of like unit. I'm not sure if it's an open space for everyone. I'm not sure if it's just for the cadets, but whenever I run past it, they're always doing like a morning workout and they've got like Romans, just like a standard, like, you know, crossfit type um, open plan workout space. So they've got rowing machines, they've got loads of kettlebells, they've got a rig with loads of bars and stuff and, you know, people doing snatches and deadlifts, whatever it may be called. And I ran past there and saw some guys, um, you know, um, uh, kettlebell swinging some heavy weights. I just think to myself, like, that shit is hard too, don't get me wrong. It's not easy to wake up in the morning and suddenly start lifting heavy weights above your head, you know, behind your shoulders or, you know, on top of your chest or whatever, or rowing 5K. Not, it's not easy to do whatsoever, but nothing really compares to running outside, especially when you're kind of competitive with yourself. Like, I've got a slight little, you know, competitive edge where I don't really like to run slow. You know when you walk past people when they're running? Um on the way back from work or they're running to work and they've got that kind of really like, uh, like they're about to die. Like, do you know what I mean? Like it's like they've been running for 22 miles, but they haven't just been running for four or whatever it may be. And they've got horrible running form. They're letting their body sway left and right. And that's expending, you're expending more energy that way. Do you know what I mean? You're slamming your feet on the ground, which again is expending more energy. Just, you know, just terrible form all around. And I never, I went, never wanted to look at that. I always wanted to look like I knew what I was doing when I was running. So, so you know what I mean? And again, to the, to, the, to the average person on the street, they won't have a flipping idea what I'm doing, right? All they'll, all they'll see or all they'll hear is this massive guy behind them breathing heavily, running past them, right? So they'll hold on to their, their purses or they'll try and get out of the way. They won't get my running gait. But in my head, I have this idea that somehow um, regular civilians have an understanding of what good running form is. They know what pose running is. They're familiar with CrossFit endurance. And they know that the fact that I'm getting my heels and they're slapping at the bottom of my bum, that means I'm running really well. And the fact that I'm running on the balls of my feet and I'm leaning slightly forward and my body's super taut that I'm a good runner. But I'm sure they're not really noticing that. Um, but yeah, that's what happened. So yeah, I get in a bit of a weird situation where today I was meant to do it light. I was meant to go around quite light and end up kind of just speeding up because I was fed up of running slow. So I ended up speeding up, which ends up, of course ended up me blowing up my ass. But you know, in general, I kind of got what I need to get to, and now here I am um, talking to you guys and having a little bit of a good time. The funny thing is about this podcast is I recorded one yesterday before work, but for some reason it didn't save or it didn't record, and I think it was because my hard drive was completely full, and it kept bringing me that warning about your hard drive disk is full, start whatever. There. So I just kept recording, right? I kept dism- dismissing. But I guess it didn't it didn't save it because there wasn't many memory on it, so it just kind of left it. It kind of let the program run, but it didn't actually save the the file. So I tried to play it, it wasn't playable. So essentially I'm re-recording another episode, but when people say these sort of things, it doesn't really matter, does it? Because you don't you wouldn't have no idea. I could be lying and you wouldn't know. But you know, the truth is I did record another one, but I'm having to re-record it now because my computer died. So I think what I might do today is actually record two, record this one, which I was meant to record yesterday, and then record another one today, which I'm meant to record today. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Anyway, um, I've been good, man. I've been feeling amazing. It's been quite a good um, weekend so far. I've taken my weekend while I do my weekend. I went to DJ. Um, I went out for a bit with the missus on Saturday and on Sunday stayed in. Um, that was basically my weekend. I was meant to go out to Egg. I was meant to go out to a few other clubs and stuff, but I never ended up getting around to it just because, you know, I ended up getting a bit tired. 
And essentially, I think I was kind of looking forward to this week because this week is Good Friday. I didn't know, right? We've got a bank holiday this week, so we've got a three-day weekend. So this would be a perfect time to kind of go out and have a bit of fun. Plus, I'm DJing twice this weekend. I'm DJing on Friday at Tappy, on my night there. So you guys, if you're in the area and you want to have a bit of a laugh, come down there. It, show, it shall be a good time. It could be a good time. It always is a good time. They serve loads of craft beer at Tap East. They have great staff. I'll be playing the beats alongside somebody else. I'm not sure who's covering for Natalia this time around, but I'll be there anyway regardless. So if you're worried about that, do not be worried. So that's me at Tap East. Me at Tap East this uh, Friday. You can see that on the screen there, right? Tap East there. Boom, bang, 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 bang. And then um, on the Saturday, I'm DJing at a private warehouse party in Hackney Wick somewhere, I'm sure, or maybe somewhere else. Um, on the Saturday from 8 till 10, I'm going to do like an R&B set in the beginning, right? Which is going to be quite interesting because um, I'm looking forward to playing that because, you know, I don't get to play that sometimes. It's twofold, right? Because sometimes in these warehouse parties, I feel because you know what I've done, right? Which is interesting. And I think sometimes it's, it kind of may be painting me in the corner. When I used to play these warehouse parties before, um, in the beginning, when I kind of got my first start, which I kind of have to be thankful for, especially with the guys that booked me the first couple of times in the Hacking Week warehouse parties. When I got my start there, what I do? Um, in terms of, because I always, I, I used to go to a lot of warehouse parties, right? A lot of like, you know, ones that you can bring your own drink, ones that you have to pay £10 and you can bring on whatever it may be called. Just, you know, a party in somebody's like warehouse space or a party in somebody's house. Um, I used to do DJs and those kind of things. Oh, I used to go to those things a lot. And the thing that used to kind of annoy me sometimes was that, you know, it was always like these, because um, I was cutting myself at that time too. I'd always, let's say, you know, it was these bedroom DJs who were going full pelt trying to play, you know, a, a kind of like their version of a resident advisor set, right? So a crowd full of people who were just, you know, just for the most part wanting to have a good time, right? They weren't necessarily there for the music. They were just there for the vibes because it was free. Um... Yeah, so that's basically, and then I kind of got a bit, sometimes a bit frustrated because like, come on, man, like, let's soften it up a little bit. Let's give it, let's, I don't know, let's bring in some hits or something. I don't know, whatever it may be, just not, let's not just play these all these obscure um, techno house cuts that no one really knows about, especially the techno stuff, right? It just got a little bit too heavy. So whenever I, so I've always made a promise to myself, but if ever I got booked, I would just play like a really fun set. Like I'd play Drake, I'd play Rihanna, I'd play R&B, I'd play hip hop. I might swing in some some house, some Afro beats in there, but I went to it to be a fun set, right? And that's what I always that's my, my kind of dream, right, to do. And I always thought that'd be amazing if you rocked up to a house party and suddenly, you know, you heard someone playing like a really good set. Because you know, for some, for the most time, whenever you go to house parties, the ones I've been to, anyway, especially the ones with my trendy mates, there's always like one or two people there who are just like obsessed with just being all over the fucking playlist. Now, fair enough, it's their house, it's their rules, they can do what they want, but. The playlist hogs, the ones that are always controlling what comes next, are annoying because I get it. Their heart's in a good place, right? They don't want the mood to be ruined by somebody coming in and playing Spice Girls, right? Because, you know, there's always that one girl that comes in. Oh, look, how do you get Spice Girls? Cool. It's cool for the first time, but for the fourth, third, for the fourth, fifth, and sixth time, like, relax, my dear. So I get what they're doing. But I think for the average folk, the annoying thing is that, you know, you don't get, you don't really get like a consistent bit of music. It's all kind of a bit haphazard. It kind of comes from one person. It's a bit weird, isn't it? Just a bit weird. So I made promise myself whenever I do go DJ that I'll do the same thing. But now, I think because I always play that sort of stuff, they always ask me to play that sort of stuff, and I would like to play a little bit more techno in house. You know what I mean? Like, because I don't really get to play that most of the time, right? Because I, I get to, you know, I play a lot of disco in these bars and pubs that I play in sometimes, and sometimes there might be some house in there depending on where I'm playing at. But for the most part, I have to, I have to play what they want me to play, really, innit? For the most part, and then I kind of have to then. In an effort to play what they want me to play, I can then start slipping a bit of my personality. But I'm not coming into it like, you know, like a Maceoplex or like whatever, or like a Crystal Clear and walk in and say, no, this is what, this is, this is what I'm about. You either love it or hate it, right? Um, I don't really get that kind of, um, um, I don't really get that kind of um, room to do that. But this time around, I'm going to be playing the same sort of set again at Wales Party. So, so, you know, looking forward to it. You no, know, I would have liked to have played a little bit more, something different, but I think I'm going to make it a little bit more interesting by playing a lot of Afro beats and shit and mix up a little bit, make it a bit soft, maybe play some girl tunes. I think that'd be some awesome stuff to do. And I'm looking really looking forward to that. It should be good. I'm doing 8 or 10, so that's a good early set. I don't need to be too fucked up. I don't need to get a bit too early. I don't, well, I'm there early, but I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I'm happy that I'm playing that early. I don't necessarily want to be there super late, Um, and you know, into the wee hours of the night and stuff. Because I think the plan is... I'll probably go and play there on the first... No, I'll, this is what the plan I'm going to try and do. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I want to try and go out on the Thursday to a club night. Um, then I want to try and do my DJ on a thing on a Friday night, stay in, then I, or stay in the whole day, then do my DJ set on a Friday. Then on Saturday, I want to go to that warehouse party and play. 
and on Sunday I just want to chill. So I kind of want to have I want to have my my going out time on this Friday coming up. That's kind of the plan. And I think there's quite a few events, isn't it, happening this first this Friday, this Good Friday or this Thursday? Because I'm sure I'm sure most people do the same thing that I've heard a lot of people do nowadays. That I've been more cognitive of, and I think it's when you get older, right? You start to become a little bit less uh, reckless. You start to become a little bit more conservative. You start to maybe plan your nights out weeks in advance, right? Like an old lady. But um, I remember hearing a lot of people say, you know, um, New Year's Eve, right? I used to be the kind of guy that was obsessed with going out on New Year's Eve so that I could celebrate the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 bullshit, right? But a lot of people, what they would do instead is that they would go out, like, imagine if New Year's Eve fell on a Tuesday and New Year's, I don't know, the actual New Year's Eve fell on a Tuesday or whatever, maybe, or something, or on a Monday. They'd actually go out the weekend before that, right? Just so they could, you know, have, like, a basically a free weekend and then basically another two days to just relax and chill and some clubs as well like you know it's a bit corny but some clubs will do the, te- the will do the countdown shit like just to make up for the guys that aren't actually there on new year's eve right there a few days before and i just think that's a bit weird but now looking back at it being older i think you know what it's actually a better thing to do because what inevitably happens is that you inevitably go out again you go out on the weekend because you're feeling hype and it's the end of what i don't know maybe you broke up for work really late but you know you go up you go in a, you go out that weekend before new year's eve then you go out again on the New Year's Eve day, and then by the time you get to work, you are literally hanging, like hanging beyond belief. It's just even if you don't drink, it's just exhausting to be around so many people on New Year's Eve weekend all that time. So I think what I might do for these bank holidays is just instead of going out on that first, instead of going out on the Friday, go out on the Thursday after work, and then just kind of stay in the weekend of the weekend. And plus, because I've got essentially got two jobs, I'm working a nine to five, and I'm working on the weekends doing DJ stuff. I kind of have to be a little bit more conscious of how I use my time and not kind of just, you know, go around and fuck around all the time or whatever it may be. So that should be something good I'm looking forward to. Um, um, so, yeah, w- w- what's happening this weekend? Let me have a quick look and see, actually, through the events history on Resident Advisor, my favourite place to be, always on this fucking website. Let's see what they've got here. Um, so Thursday the 18th. There's probably going to be quite a few big events in it happening, right? Let's zoom in a little bit. Oh, yeah, see, already. There's one already I see here from Fabric. 20th anniversary. I think that's an anniversary that a few people... I think I heard somebody from this woman uh, complaining or throwing a bit of shade saying that, you know, again, a whole lineup full of white dudes or something like that. I forgot what it was, but, you know. <coughs> to be fair, like, I get what they're saying, but I, I don't ever go to Fabric for avant-garde, no, for well, avant-garde, but, like, you know, for forward-thinking music or artists. Like, you know what I mean? It's quite... It's basically the commercial end of, like, electronic music, and it? it's sort of, like, the less commercial end of, of Ministry and Sound. Even though Ministry and Sound, I think, are going to have Harvey, I think, this weekend, right? Um, which I'm interested about that collaboration. I'm sure it's something to do with somebody. Maybe is he getting offered loads of money? Is it because the person that owns um, Ministry is a, very much steeped in the electronic music scene? Because Ministry has a very um, rich history that Harvey's trying to tap into, and he's not really he doesn't really care about what it is nowadays. I don't know. It's interesting booking up. But anyway, so on Thursday you've got Fabric 20th anniversary. With John Digby, John Digby playing live. You got Cirque du Soleil, Cirque du Soleil sorry, um, with Detroit Swindle, Harry Wolfman. You've got Bad Bruises in London with Sodom and Gomorrah. Electro, oh, I love Electroworks. I've mentioned it before, and Electroworks is such a cool venue. I think I've been there a couple times for a boiler room, I'm going to say, right? And it was fucking awesome. It's such a weird space. Like, I don't understand how, I, I, again, like, I quite like what they did here with the forward slashes. Instead of doing it, yeah, I like that. With location and the forward slashes, I quite like that. Uh, labels. Um, It's such a weird venue. Oh, look at that. Wow. This looks awesome. It's such a cool venue. Um, there's so many weird little hidden rooms everywhere in the Electro Works. Um, again, I'm, I'm surprised more people don't use that space, and I'm sure they do, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just not aware of it. But it's such a cool, interesting space, especially now that you know most of our club spaces or clubbing spaces are being uh, decimated due to the hackney licensing laws. Um, you might have to be a little bit more creative in the spaces that you use and shit. But I really like Electro Works. It's really one of my favorite venues in London. Um, it, it, outside of it being a club, just essentially how it is, like you know, there's weird stairs everywhere, little side doors and secret rooms and shit. It's fucking awesome. If someone could actually turn it into a proper club, that'd be fucking banging. Um, then you've got Tribes with Fort Remu, Even Bags, and Nick Sanyano at the cause. I, need to, I still haven't been to the cause yet. I need to go. I think this might be a good opportunity. Again, 20 quid. God, oh, my cheap. No, oh, it's, a, it's a good, oh, to be honest, it's a good price, though. You get to pay 20 quid for a party that starts at 5 and ends at 5 a.m., 5, 5 to 5. That's fucking nuts. Of course, there won't be that many people there at 5, but, you know, still, it's quite a good um, place to go. Who's small people? Hmm. Are those the brothers that have the bar in Berlin? I'm not too sure. Oh, no, it's Hamburg. Okay, small people. Never heard of them. 
So they're playing that. That should be quite fun. Uh, tribes, you've got um, Tokyo Fantasy, Fort Remu, Small People, to, um, Earthly Measures, Even Bags, Nick Soniano, Studio 54 Legend, Hannah Holland. Awesome. Really good lineup that. And then what else have you have here? You have Clash and Capital, UK's biggest DMB festival at Printworks. That's going to be fucking messy, right? It's going to be bloody shards of ketamine and pills all over the fucking dance floor. Um, Seth Troxler at Village Underground. You've got US Garage Warehouse Rave at a Oh really? That's good. That, that, that's a pretty good promotion, isn't it? Again, I'm not. I'm, I wish I was. I, I don't really wish I was a promoter because that's a really, a really a specific kind of job for a specific kind of person. But um, that's a really good idea, actually. A UK garage warehouse party at the busy building. That's awesome. That's a really good idea. You know, and again, special guests. You don't need. To, you don't really need to have anyone that famous. Really, you can just have you know, just you and your friends, and maybe I don't know. I guess you know they might. Someone's gonna pull out one man there, isn't it? Right? One man's like the go-to. Uh, Party dapier in it for anyone in the scene that doesn't want to, that wants to book somebody big but doesn't want to spend big bucks in it because he's always up for playing like he plays at the most random places ever like, that, that, that's how you know he loves music he loves the DJ he plays everywhere like someone if someone's offering him money he'll play like he'll play everywhere literally fucking kill it like he's probably one of my favorite guys in London point hands down hundred uh, percent what have you got here Till Stewart Sway Seth Trucks Village Underground oh interesting. I think that's a live set there as well. DJ Harvey, of course, I mentioned the sound. Lexus Taylor. Hot Chip is absolutely going for it with a DJ. Floating Points and Alexander Nutt at five miles. That should be fucking awesome. So loads of really good parties happening on a Thursday, as I as I assumed. I think a lot of people are going to start going on a Thursday. Let's have a quick look at the Friday. I think most people are going to go out on that Thursday to have a good time. On that Friday, you've got uh, Printworks. You've got Book of Shade there. You've got the Bussy Building Party there happening. You've got Horse Meat Disco, the Prince of Wales. That should be fucking awesome. Um, what else do we have here? You've got Laurent Garnier. Oh, that Oval Space. That should be awesome. But that Oval Space is so, so overpriced. Mamma mia. Charles Peterson, X a while. Yeah. Loads of good stuff. Loads of good stuff. Loads of good stuff. Happy to see that. So, yeah, if you're, I guess if you are in London or in the UK and you want to have a good time, I would suggest trying to go out on that Thursday. I think that's what I'm going to do. Just, just to be a... Like an actual adult go out on a Thursday have a good time that way and then you can have a little bit of a free day a proper free day weekend and relax and take your time because I'm, I'm sure there'll be loads of street food festivals and, and fairs and stuff that you can probably go to during the day that'll be quite advantageous the things that you kind of wish you would go to but you know you end up being a bit of a loser and getting smashed and ending up recovering for the next two or three days not talking to myself just talking to everyone in general <laughs> Oh, God, I need to take my energy tablets too. But again, I don't like to be drowsy. But anyway, let's move on. Um, Talking about DJs, right? Talking about dojos. Just this weekend, Coachella passed, right? Coachella just passed this weekend. It was fucking awesome. Really, really good. I watched it live um, on my laptop, um, which probably made me a little bit more tired than I probably should have been, especially when you um, add the fact that I was in DJing and I've been going out and shit. So I watched that live. I watched the UFC live. So that's probably why I'm feeling like a fucking wreck. Like, it all makes sense. No problem. Great job, Agassi, though. So um, that that happened this weekend, and um, it was fucking awesome, right? Really, really good. I really like some of the performances. I'm going to get to most of them now, but the first one I want to talk about was Nina Kravitz. Nina Kravitz, who I went to go see the other day at the Wolverhampton Assembly for a retextured live, a festival put on by Crank Brothers that was fucking awesome. She debuted an audio-visual, she debuted an audio-visual um, experience, party sort of thing, that was really interesting. Now, again, it wasn't to my taste. It probably wasn't something that I'd want to go and see. But I can kind of see where the vision is. I can kind of see what she's aiming for and what she wants to do. So let me go um, to my profile. I can show you some of the things that I posted that might have made a bit more sense. So essentially, um, I didn't really have any understanding what the, uh, what the whole idea behind it was. Because I remember seeing a few articles about it prior to Coachella happening. Um, Nina Kravitz is going to be performing live at the, on the main stage at Coachella. And I was like, fuck, what an amazing booking for somebody like Nina Kravitz, right? That's... You know, for the most part, those kind of festivals, they always kind of relegate all the electronic acts to like a certain electronic stage or a certain electronic venue, but they don't necessarily put them on like, you know, main slot uh, in the evening. I think she came on just before Childish Gambino or a few other people, and then you get to kind of do your thing. But there's no real details about it. Then it transpires that on an, you know, it's going to be an audiovisual experience. It's going to be something, um, it's going to be like a precursor to her releasing a documentary called Homecoming about her return to Moscow. So I'm assuming she's moving back home and kind of uh, making her base there, which kind of ties in with her record label. So loads of good things happening. Then I watch it on live stream and it was just, it just, it blew me away because it was just so unexpected. I didn't really expect it to go that direction in her career. So essentially she comes out and um, on the stage, there's loads of electronic music. There's a couch, there's a table. 
and then behind it is a massive projection like a screen right which everyone kind of does nowadays because it's a really um cool and easy way easy i'm going to say way to kind of um create an immersive experience on stage without having too many props right because essentially you know having people come in and move things up uh, around you while you're dancing and move isn't probably the wisest thing to do. So maybe having a screen that can project different um, things on a screen, you can have maybe a different object on the stage that you can change would be a good idea. Similar to what Tyler the Creator did at the Golf Wine Festival where you kind of had, um, you kind of had, uh, what's the, what's the fucking album called? The one that came out recently. Um, you had kind of had the, that play out in the background with like, you know, forests and trees and shit. And then he had a kind of like a ramp. So then that ramp was kind of projected on, that ramp was, the, the projection on the ramp was sort of like, it was on, he was lying on a hill or on the side of a park. So they made it look like that, Jeremy. So, but then if that was in the past, you would have had to build something and have it, you know, towed in left and right. But essentially with this performance, you could just have it projected on the screen. She did the same sort of thing. And on the screen, it had like random images, but sometimes it had an image of like the top of the deck. So she was DJing, like similar to um, the Jeff Mills documentary, that the famous one where he's mixing. Then she had a, a screen coming from the right, a screen coming from the left, a screen coming from the back. Just really, really amazing, cool stuff. Really, really cool. And then she started, and I thought it would be like an M, it'll feel, it'll feel it'll be like an eight oh eight thing, right? Like her playing live, like you know, like um, like an arm or whatever, maybe called like a Henrik Schwartz, right? that kind of live stuff, right? You're playing stuff with Ableton, and you're sort of like adding loops, you're adding percussions, you're adding instruments, you're adding bass lines. I don't know. That's why I kind of thought it would be. And she pulls out the microphone and she starts singing, right? Sort of singing, like talking in Russian saying stuff in English, words are coming up behind her, the, the lights are changing, loads of smoke, she's doing that weird dance thing that she does behind the stage when she's having a good time, and it's just like a really bizarre performance, right, it's quite bizarre, and I kind of captured a little bit of it here on my on my Twitter for you guys to see, and if you're listening via the podcast app, then I'm sorry, but you'll be able to hear it, Frank, can you hear that? So that's her, right? Doing her dance thing. And and this is at the stage where she's sort of like, essentially she, she came out in a long black leather trench coat with a notebook, I think, in her hand and then big black um, cow, like riding boots. And she was kind of like dancing, doing her weird singing thing. And then throughout the whole performance, she'd like take stuff off, like take off her jacket slowly, write something down, think about something, like read, da, 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 sing. And then there's one really cute part of the thing where she was like, oh, I'm really nervous, isn't it? Thank you so much for like letting me do this. I'm really nervous. And she's doing her thing and then people were whistling and stuff and then it kind of got into her normal sort of like, you know, techno, tech house sounding sort of beats. But it was all kind of really ambient and really kind of weird and all that stuff, like, you know, maybe. And I think for the most part, from what I heard on the, on social media and from, you know, talking to people or not, well, communicating with people on social media and going, you know, because everyone was kind of tagging tagging her and, and using the hashtag Coachella when I was on Twitter and stuff, the, the the reaction was kind of split, right? And I'll read it later, but let's just play out this just a little bit. So here's on top of the table, you know, kind of doing her white people dance, you know, that kind of a performance dancing thing that white people love to do. <laughs> you remember that video of, the, of that yoga couple? They're, they're doing that kind of like weird yoga and they're like shaking on the chair. This is what it reminds me of kind of a little bit. But, you know, again, it's just an extra music. It also reminds me of any other girl that I've seen at Grease Mueller, you know, in the early hours in the morning, tripping her balls off, wearing the most amazing outfit in the middle of Berlin, right? This is what I've basically seen, or in, in Berkheim or Panama, but this is what you see, right? Club kids know what club kids do. Like, she's an OG when it comes to that malarkey, right? And I bet she's stone cold sober as well, which makes it even more cool, right? But, again, the reception was not the best when it came to her performance, right? And I was kind of, I'll read a little bit of it now that I saw with Nina... Kravitz, Coachella, right? So, um, again, the performance wasn't, the, the, the reaction wasn't as what she might have expected to be. But I have to give her credit, right? Where credit is due, I'll say I'll just say my part before I read everyone else's uh, things that they said about her. Again, it wasn't something to my taste. It wasn't something that I'd probably necessarily go to, but I have to respect her for taking a chance and going this direction with her career. Because, again, she doesn't need to... She doesn't need to do this. I think for somebody of her level, when it comes to DJing, I think she's probably done everything that she needs to do in DJing, right? She's probably played at all the best places. She released music under all, with all the best labels, collaborated with all the best people, did edits, played back-to-back -back with some of her heroes, blah, 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 blah. Now she's got her own label that she's fostering talent with. And I think maybe they just reaches a bit of a... They reach, she probably she probably reached a bit of Truman Wall, right? She probably reached a limit. She wants to see what else that she can do, especially while she's still, you know... Of 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 um good sound mind right she still has a passion for it um she's still um relevant in this industry too which is very important because you know how 
finical or how fickle this this industry can be. Essentially, electronic music, like the next hot thing comes around, or say everyone forgets about Nina Kravitz. She has to keep reinventing herself in order to kind of stay alive, right? Something I've kind of learned throughout the years from P Diddy, who would say like, you know, every name gem he does is like a calculated move. It's a effort to if it's an, it's a it's a conceded effort for him to keep himself relevant and to keep himself motivated, keep himself fresh, because every name change comes with a different persona, a different attitude, a different kind of music, right, whatever it may be. Um, that's cool. So I, I get it in that respect. And I also have to say that if she did that performance at Printworks, if she performed like that at Fold, if she did that at XOYO, if she did that at Corsica Studios, she'd fucking kill it, right? Everyone will love it. E1, Oval Space, whatever you make, whatever venue you want to call it, she'd smash it. But I think in that kind of arena, that space, I mean, for the most part, it is not far fresh to say. I'd say in the most part, the, the the average North American festival goer, especially the person that goes to Coachella, probably isn't that familiar or isn't that knowledgeable, isn't that um informed about electronic music as most the other North American people are, right? It's a bit so like the commercial end of it. So I think for the most part, people in that crowd would have known her from her DJing, right? From maybe hearing her play at a big festival, whether it's time warp, whatever maybe, right? So maybe to her to go in there and do a live set in front of that audience probably wasn't the best place to do it. But again, like I said, I think it takes massive balls in the name of uh, uh, Troy Dini Cojones to go on the Coachella stage and perform for the first time live. It takes massive, massive balls. And again, I think in general, maybe as a positioning thing, it probably was better idea for her to do it there because it positions her straight away in that top tier of live performance because, you know, there's not a lot of live performers out, especially in the electronic music space, that are actually good, right? Let's be honest, right? I know a lot of people are digging around on the social about it, but there's not a lot of people that are actually good. There's some people that people pretend are good, but they're not actually entertaining for the most part. Um, so maybe just putting yourself on that stage is going to position her at a high level. Maybe, I don't know, but I'm not too sure if it was the right move going forward. And I think a lot of people on social kind of agree with it. Um, Da, da, da. Oh, but it's a, again, this is kind of going to my set. Let's say this this person says, I'm not trusting the 16 year old follower children of Coachella to judge Nina Kravitz's live set. Anyone with clout see it, heard it, or oh, it got weird, right? Clout, that's a bit weird. Um, really takes balls to do what Nina Kravitz done, bring into Coachella a performance of arts at masses. Again, like I said, many, not, many, many may not get it, but it's a, a serious artistic statement. Nina Kravitz pulled the, any publicity is good publicity trick at Coachella. The entire team, this is on her brain. They're going to talk about me no matter what i can do i can do whatever i want on this stage in front of all these people and they'll know my name it's genius <laughs> that's true maybe Hi, someone please tell me what song is going on here how why and really right so this is um people what someone record the entire set 30 seconds of it this is what i yeah so this is a what is this Good is it, man? That isn't good, is it? That isn't good, is it, bro? Okay, uh, okay. Um, Kravitz, after watching some Nina Kravitz videos at Coachella, I find myself asking, "What the fuck is she doing?" A second floor Nina Kravitz said to be next weekend. I'm so confused. It's Nina Kravitz set. What is going on here? What the heck is going on? Nina Kravitz at Coachella. I'm seeing a lot of people, a lot of hate, but I'm not sure what the hate is actually about. What's this kind of thing? What is? Hey, Shandy, why don't you try and find out what's going on, you absolute dullard? What is going on? I'm seeing a lot of people talk about it, but I don't know what's going on. Fucking find the video then. Bloody hell, some people. What's wrong with Nina Kravitz? I haven't listened to it. Okay, enough. Shout out the wit looking at Nina Kravitz's performance. <laughs> Jesus, I'm watching Nina Kravitz and I'm actually sobbing. What the fuck? The video's free. I've ever seen rolling around the stage. I'm just standing there looking in the mirror. And, and, and all, I loved it. I loved it. The 20x that we had to see. All due respect, but who the fuck gave Nina Kravitz a market Coachella? Credit, and then here's me. Credit to Nina Kravitz, though, it takes some balls uh, to debut an immersive electronic performance like this at Coachella, all play, of all places. Not for me, but I like the idea. Just hope it's, it's an add-on to her DJing. And again, I don't know, man. It's really hard to tell... Again, it's really hard to tell anyone what to do with anything, right? Because it just... Because you never know. She could get better, right? I'm sure her first DJ set wasn't good, right, Nina Kravitz. I'm sure she got better over time. But also, I'm not too sure how... The problem is nowadays, if Nina Kravitz was around nowadays and she looked the way that she did and she was, I don't know, 18, someone would book her at Tomorrowland, right? Which is the worst thing to do because I think, you know, they'd book her essentially because she's a good-looking woman 
and you know, imagine she put together a couple of good tunes on SoundCloud, right? Just two that she happened to like pull out of her ass because you know you've got the, your whole entire life to make good two really good songs. It's the songs after that that really get really difficult. But imagine someone finds a young Nina Kravitz on on SoundCloud now. They would 100% book her at tomorrow now. They would 100% book her at Time Warp, at fucking whatever festival you call, you want to name, right? She'd get booked straight away. And I think that's the, that's the problem because essentially what happened is that a young Nina Kravitz wouldn't get the time to develop, right? You wouldn't necessarily time, get time to hone your craft and get better. we kind of seen the same thing happen with Peggy Goo, where, you know, she's a, a relatively good DJ. She makes good productions, but is she at the level that her bookings uh, um, would... Is she at the level of her bookings, like the number of her bookings? Probably not. But again, DJ world isn't really about your. It's not really about that. It's around your popularity, right? That time when Steph Trucks and Jamie Truck and Jamie Jones were everywhere, they weren't necessarily getting booked that much because you know they were the best DJs around. They were getting booked that much because they were the talk of the town. Especially that that back in the, back in that day, social media wasn't even as prevalent as it was nowadays. Um, they would get talked about all the time. They had all the famous interviews, great great um, articles on them. Like it was a really love or hate relationship with them. So essentially, if you're a promoter, it's an easy easy booking to make because people that don't like them are gonna go and see them just to go see if they're shit, and people that love them are gonna go see them because they're fanboys. So I think if you're Nina Kravitz, maybe because of your name, you probably sh- you probably getting given opportunity. You probably shouldn't be get given because you need to hone your craft and get better over time. But it also side of me that's saying she. There's also a side of me that's like. I'm in no place to tell anyone what they should do or shouldn't do, right? Because you never know. She could absolutely smack it out of the park. And, and you know, what we say is good and what we say is bad is quite subjective. But judging from her comments on social and stuff, it looks like a lot of people are also agreeing with the fact that it wasn't good, right? And they don't really like it. Um, yeah, so so here's a... Here's a fucking that was brutal, man, the internet. Um, so here's a here's a here's like a... Post again here on the interwebs. I'm pretty sure she doesn't read it. She probably shouldn't read it. Some of the teams should probably tell her not to read these comments because you know it's probably gonna put her off and stuff. But here's another video on Instagram right of the performance. So let's let's play this. It's that short shit, and it says, "Oh." Um, Nina Kravitz, this is the first part of my Coachella show that I did with uh, uh, whatever. How much do you want to get? How much do you want to bet that you won't do this again the next week? Next weekend? I, I, how much do you want to bet it's just her straight DJing? Um, and the first comment, horrible. You need some honest people around you, uh, you Nina. This is shit. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Replies back to, oh, you checked my profile to come up with some witty. Let's see. Uh, what does it say here? Uh, shut shut the fuck up exactly my force when i heard this uh you're delusional if you think this is good uh what's it get get the asset back so sorry it turned out so bad maybe next time get people around you who will be honest and tell you what's on a good level good taste and in range of your skill will save you the feeling of embarrassment for both the spectators and performers i don't think she's gonna be embarrassed though i just think you need to you need to do these things right in order to get good um nina we love you but what is this horrible noise maybe next time just call this show different just so the people expecting the techno set don't get upset well she did say it was different she just says all the visual experience what do you expect so is nina grand is nina so is ariana grande about to throw down a techno set tonight a bunch of average joes telling an established dj who's who who's who who has a push boundaries of music for the last good knows how long take a bow for your courage for carrying on a pushing on boundaries of music taking us out of our comfort zone, teaching us how to look into the future of music. Exactly, because it is, again, what what, what can she, she's Nina Kravitz, what she, can she do? She, she can't really actually go play at a bar and get played this song. I mean, she she can't, you know, her level, she just can't do that. She has to go and play at big stages. So I think, uh, essentially, you know, she's been walled in by her success. But, you know, let her let her get better over time. That one wasn't good, you know, subjectively. I'd say it wasn't good, but I think over time it could get better. But again... I think, imagine if you went to that set expecting a, a, a hard-nosed techno set from her and you get that, you're like, oh my God. Um, so yeah, so that wasn't good. Um, but again, she ended the set by doing a whirly purly swirling along the floor and everyone kind of, and people were cheering in this crowd, but again, I don't know what that says about anything because, you know, sometimes people cheering are just there for a good time. They don't necessarily care what you're doing. But essentially, you know, I'm a fan of hers. I, I, I say give her, give her a chance. Um, and let her get better over time. Um, who else was good that I thought we'd talk about? Oh, Virgil actually had a had pretty interesting set at Coachella. I didn't watch it, but it looks fucking cool. Um, where's the pictures? 
He put he posts some really fucking cool pictures on here. Actually, yes, here it is. Um, so Virgil did a, an, another kind of immersive set. I'm assuming it was immersive or some sort of like or something along those kind of lines. And again, it's interesting because I think I've said it to my low level when I was when I was playing at the Tap East. I think I mentioned it to um the the, the couple that I'm organising with that I'd love to maybe have a little bit more of a setup in the place, right? Get you know dress up a little bit more. And there's not that there's not more of it that happens a lot, right? And I think essentially when you're playing at a festival. I think the reason why I don't like festival DJs and set in general DJs playing at festivals is that it's just it doesn't feel right, right? Because I'm so used to being in a nightclub and having it in a walled environment and you know like locked doors, dark rooms, smoke everywhere. So having an open space, having a DJ play, especially so far away on the stage, you can't really see them. You don't really get the sense that you're actually together in this thing together, or you're actually like close to the intimate space, which you obviously not. It's Coachella, but I think the way you can fake an intimacy, right? You can maybe. Um, uh, engineer um, warmth and connection is by having these massive screens, right? You see a lot with Travis Scott, Kanye, Drake, ASAP Rocky. Those massive, especially when I saw ASAP Rocky at Prima Vera, that massive screen, especially for the girl, they were loving it. You got to see his face right up close and close because the camera was zooming and you get to see a massive face of his on the side of the stage. So even if he's not moving around the stage too much, you get to see where he is everywhere at all times. And I think as a DJ, Especially, oh, the Drake show is a good example of that too, that rectangular stage you're performing, and there's screens all around it, right? So the stage and the screens all around the top of it. So even if you're not seeing the stage, you can just see the screen, you see him walking around the whole thing. So I think as a DJ, it's a really good thing to do because you get to see him play, and then you get to put up loads of different projections on the screen that get to, you know, make it a bit more fun. And he did the same sort of thing at Coachella, and it looks fucking awesome. So I've got it up here on the screen for you guys to check out. Um, if you guys are, if you guys listen to the podcast, I've just gone Virgil Abloh's Instagram post. And it's a post that says "Time flies," and I think it's a it's a bit it's a bit of type that was designed by uh, Futura, the graffiti and street made god for the most part. Um, so this is kind of what he designed about it. He designed the kind of the, the front of it. Um, they put it up here behind a screen, and so you got Virgil Abloh playing here on a massive table, which I love, like right in the height that you need. Uh, with a massive projection on the back of it, put, putting together like random images behind him. And then you've got this image at the top, which is kind of similar to Jeff Mills' documentary that kind of came to prominence again due to the interview that he did recently with um, Resident Advisor, the kind of seminal one that most DJs kind of recite as a kind of reason to why everyone kind of gets started in DJing or wants to become a better DJ. And then, um, again, you've got these little nice fucking um, images that come up behind the screen that really kind of set the vibe, you know, kind of take inspiration from these architectural days. Um, and just in general, just a very immersive and real experience. It just feels fucking awesome, right? And then what makes it even cooler is wearing the gloves, right? They designed for, um, I think it's off-white, the kind of construction gloves. And look at the fucking decks. Look at the decks. They're see-through, pers perspex, like completely see-through, Pioneer um, CDJs. I'm not just sure if this is a, a Pacific collaboration or if it's something that he just got done specially made for him, but that looks fucking cool. Like see-through CDJs. Like that is so fucking cool. Um, amazing, like really, really awesome. Like I can't, I can't get by how great that looks. I think the mixer's see through too, right? Completely clear. Like look at that. Look how cool that looks. Like look how cool that looks. See through, clear pi pioneer DJ. Like that just looks insane in this mixer, of course, with three D CDs. A lot of people are doing nowadays. It's just, it's just insane. It's really, really amazing. And I'm hoping there's a video made by. I think I saw a picture of Glen Jam uh, recording a video. The legendary kind of YouTube dude that records loads of kind of um, culturally relevant uh, streetwear Pacific kind of content. He goes to Coachella. He goes to Art Basel. He goes all that. Remember that stuff I, I talk about in the influencer cheat sheet, right? So that's what the kind of thing that he goes to. So I recommend you check it out. But yeah, Virgil did a pretty good set. It looks like I liked it a bit. I kind of missed the live stream, which I'm glad about. Hopefully someone recorded it so I can watch later because he usually plays quite a good. Um, hip hop set for the most part and kind of mixes in other stuff, so that was quite cool to see. So, but again, I'm liking I'm liking that the fact that at these live performances, I think for the most part, it just gets boring if you're a DJ playing behind like you know a massive black box with just a, a bit of cloth on the front of it. It's good to kind of make it a bit more expressive, and I like how bare, how kind of uh, stripped down it is. Just the table with the things on it, the camera on top, the screen at the back. It's really fucking precise and amazing. And I'm, I think hopefully in the next couple of years we'll see probably more DJs and more people, more artists. Uh, start to take a bit more of a active role in kind of the construction of the units that they use when they're DJing and everything. And we're going to see maybe advance a little bit more than what we've seen in previous years. Um, what is next here on the list? Oh, Charles Gambino, right? Charles Gambino performed too. That was a really good performance. Um, again, um, Charles Gambino has really separated himself, I think, from the pack, right? He's really kind of gone um, further than I'd ever think he would have gone. But I think it's kind of, 
tied in a lot with just these kind of cultural relevancy with the stuff they do with Atlanta, the other bits of writing did, the comedy he's doing, um, the music videos, of course, with This Is America. And it feels as if, like, now, finally, his music is starting to catch up with all his stuff outside of music. Because it always felt like he was a little bit more... I wouldn't say talented, but it seemed like he had more body. He had a more, he had a better body of work in his acting and his writing career than he did in maybe uh, music, which made sense. Maybe because he, they started at the same time, which is sure maybe the F, maybe he didn't put as much time in it as he did his other stuff. But it seems as if now he's finally his music is finally catching up, and he's he's turning into a fucking beast. Like I saw the trailer for Guava Island, the film he did with Rihanna, and that looks fucking amazing. I can't wait to watch that over the weekend. And he just t- he's turning into a beast. And this performance at Coachella, I think, might be the marker in the ground of just how big of a of how big of a person he's going to be in the industry going forward. That performance was awe inspiring, mesmerizing. Number one, the the camera work, the cinematography for it was amazing. I think I made a tweet the other day about you know whoever was a cameraman for that festival needs to get a raise because or for Charlie Gambino's set needs to have a raise because he was he was go he was doing bits. He was kind of following Gambino like in a really theatrical. Um, uh, DVD kind of style way where when it, there was like a runway that um, Charles Gambino had that he was kind of running down like most artists do on these performances at Coachella that kind of makes you go into the crowd and then the kind of camera was following him in a sort of frame that made it look like a documentary then when he was sitting down then when he went to the crowd he filmed him a really cool way too Charles Gambino lit up a joint and said he wants to smoke with me he gave it to some random fan and started talking that's just insanely good he did a he did a song where he was singing in fucking some African language. I don't know how the hell he knows this language. His dancing has got even better than what it was before. He looks amazing on stage. He he looks like he's been working out a bit as well. Like he just looks cool as fuck, man. Dyed his beard blonde. He just look he's looking like such a he's looking like such a contemporary um He's, he's looking at such a really avant-garde, weirdo, arty guy. Like, I'm loving it. I'm loving how he's embracing. I'm loving the direction he's kind of leaning into, you know? Like, he just looks fucking cool. I really fucking love it. Um, and I really want to understand what the what the thinking is behind the topless thing. When when the dress child with, the, with no top on. I wonder what that's about. Like, so this America thing. I wonder what, that's, what's, what kind of, what that represents. Him being topless like that. Because he doesn't have most performances. He never wears a top for the most part. Um... But let's let's check. So but anyway, one 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 clip that he kind of um, a bit section of the show that was you know a bit somber, a little bit of a reality check, or brought the temp- temperature slightly down. The performance was he gave the tribute to char- tri- tribute to uh, Nipsey Hussle, Mac Miller, and his late father who also passed away in the last few months. And it was a very touching tribute, and I think it caught a lot of people off guard because some people were hooting and hollering in the crowd, but he was being dead serious. But let's uh, let's play a little bit of it now. So you guys are here. Um, and it kind of got me thinking about what's been happening lately, especially with the passing of most of our, uh, was especially the passing of some of our heroes that we kind of look up to, especially when it comes to uh, Nipsey Hussle and Mac Miller. Um, here we go. I felt bad because I uh, broke my foot. I kind of let people down. And I remember my dad saying, like, he's like, you do what you're supposed to do. Like, every moment is special. Like, you know, I lost, I lost my dad this year. We we lost Nipsey, we lost Mac, we lost. What I'm starting to realize is all all we really have is memories. At the end of the day, that and that is the brutal honesty, right? That we only have memories. I think that's what you realize, especially when you get older, and you start to you know. I think the first person that maybe died from my group of friends I knew from school was when I was maybe in sixth form. And, you know, by that time, you've already moved on. You have a different social group. You kind of, you know, you put uh, secondary school to the back of your mind. So when someone mentions a name to you, you forget who they even are. And that really makes you feel bad. And you're like, fuck, I don't even remember who that person is. Then you remember them from like a random thing that happened in a school playground at lunchtime. You just remembered some random thing you did with me. Like, fuck, that person isn't around anymore. We're the same age. Like, what? like you, don't, you don't understand someone could, that was your age just die like that, right? I think that dude might have died of natural causes. I think, no, sorry, I think he might have died of an illness. I'm pretty sure it was something like leukemia or something, right? But imagine, you don't really know, you can't picture in your head somebody your age just dying just like that. It just doesn't make any sense. Then you get older and you start to realise that um, essentially, like, all you really have are the memories, right? You really have the memories. Like, you can't ever re-experience things, especially when you mess, especially when you mess with drugs and alcohol, right? You start to realise that, especially when I went on the first, my 30-day, you know, breaks and stuff and I kind of take time off from doing anything you start to realize just how um fleeting those moments are and how much time they take away from your living your actual life right 
We've all been on that. We've all been there when you're hungover and you're in bed. And you're just like hating your life and your head's throbbing. Every time you kind of trying to lean up to stand up, your head starts to spin and shit. You just feel horrible, right? You start to question your life choices. You're like, you go and look yourself in the mirror. You just feel like shit. We've all been there, right? When you when you have too much to drink, um, and you're too much or too much a good time, you start to realize that like, fuck, I'm wasting so much time, right? Because you've wasted hours that morning not doing anything. Just because you've been hungover. And imagine all the times that you've been like that, right? Just in terms of hungover, in terms of busy, whatever it may be. So then we start to realize that, you know what? Instead of wasting my time indulging in these things, I should maybe savor these memories, these moments in my life that aren't ever going to come back again, right? Because they're so fleeting. They're so, so fleeting. Especially when somebody very prominent passes away, right? Nip Tussle passes away. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, everyone kind of forgets about it in the cultural zeitgeist. His family and friends weren't because the hate, the hurt is going to be there. And they're going to fill that pain, that void of somebody that was such, so important to them as a family, as a as just a, a figurehead. They're never going to forget that pain. But for the general public, like, you'll forget it in about two weeks, right? And then you move on to the next. So that was why it was quite important to hear Charles Gambino say that. And also in the beginning of his performance, he berate, kind of berated the crowd in a funny sort of way and told them not to record, right? Put your phones out and enjoy yourself, right? Just live for this experience. This is like the... First night of Coachella, I'm closing out the show. It's Charles Gambino. I'm back on the stage. I was meant to perform here a few years ago, but I broke my foot. I'm back again, right? I've got my chance to kind of show out here again. You guys want to see me? Put your phones out. Just live experiences. I live it. And oddly enough, it kind of worked, right? There wasn't as many phones during his set as the other sets I watched previously. People were actually dancing and having a good time. It was fucking awesome to see, especially the girls at the front, who are usually the ones that love to record. They were just standing there and looking doughy eyed at him, right? It was really cool to see, like, for once, to go into a crowd, seeing a camera, not seeing that many, like, you know, fluorescent screens staring at him and stuff. But, yeah. Let's continue. That's all we are. It's like, all we are is, like, really, like, data. And you pass it on to your kids, and you pass it on to your friends, your family. The problem with, like, us, like, millennials, like, everybody here, we have so much data, like we know what's gonna happen. We're we're too afraid to plant a tree that we know we're not gonna eat from. You know, because uh, that's there's a hundred thousand of you out here right now. Like this, this, this don't shout, there's a see. chance, there's a good chance that some of y'all, at least one of y'all, won't see next week. <laughs> That was a brutally macabre moment of the thing as well. <laughs> Incredible guys. The girl's like, yeah, 100,000 people. Hey, I wouldn't laugh if I was you because there's a, there's a good chance you might not be around next week. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, that was what it was. It was fucking hilarious. But um, it, back to the real point, it does make me think though, because in general, I've, I've kind of always had that kind of thinking and I kind of don't do it too much in the UK. But whenever I go abroad, I always kind of give myself a little rule where I'm not really allowed to use my phone too much. Like, I use my phone to kind of get around using maps, but when I'm in a place, when I'm in a bar, when I'm hanging around people, when I'm going to even to a park on my own, I never touch my phone. I just want to be in the moment and experience stuff. And I never say no to stuff, right? If I bump into somebody in a bar, and they're like, hey, come here. Cool, let's go to this thing. I just say yes. I say yes to everything. And let, let my, let, let it, I let it, um, I let my, um, you know, I surrender myself to the moment. Kind of like a... That's that's the Burning Man added, uh, um, phrase, right? Um, always say yes, right, to everything. Whenever someone is inviting something, come here, do you know what I mean? Like, open yourself to adventure. And I think for the most part, that's what happens when you're a millennial or you have a smartphone in your pocket. You have too much data. You have too much access to information. You know everything. So you don't get into any kind of spontaneity. There's no spontaneous moments. I think I mentioned it before to a couple of friends, actually. That was maybe explain it. Because I always complain to my friends that London isn't very spontaneous. It's a great city to go out, right, because there's loads of... I think London, again... I think in terms of club nights, in terms of music, musical diversity, I think there's no other place better than this, right? I can go up the road to the Bells in Leighton Stone and hear a group, a cover band of, of, of old dudes playing like great records or great tunes with a live band serving some great craft beer. I can go to Fonica in here or whatever person, uh, well, so I can go to X Wire in here, like an established DJ, have a residency for four weekends straight. I can go to all these different venues, right? And hear amazing music from metal to rock to whatever it may be. But one thing we don't have is spontaneity. There's not that kind of like feeling of just like, oh, you can just go to this thing. You always have to book a ticket in advance. It's RSVP to this. There's not, a, it, everything is data driven, right? Reserve entry, send in your name. Everything is very, very much data. There's the action I have to make. When life is, the experience that I've had that really defined me, that really made me who I am, that really kind of um, opened my eyes to things, 
have been the spontaneous moments where I've just kind of surrendered to myself to the moment and just let myself kind of like go wherever the wind blows me in that respect. But especially when you're on holiday, like I used to do this thing when I, especially when I went to South America for a little bit, I do this thing where I just keep turning right wherever I went to like a new city or a new place, new town, especially I'm walking on my own in the morning, just turn, keep turning right. And I, and I started doing it and I was running, right? Because in the morning I'd try and run in the morning and I tried to spec out a route to run. I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't know where I am. It doesn't matter. Just run until you get tired. So I just keep running to places until I get tired. And sometimes you end up in a sketchy area, but sometimes you end up in a really interesting place. Like, shit, I didn't know the place existed. And you don't, in, in, sometimes you don't see it on a map, right? And again, it's hard to do nowadays because there's so much access to data, but I guess little things help, like, you know, in the morning. Uh, don't stare at your phone, you know what I mean? Like, the first few hours of the morning, I don't look at social media. I'm just, like, kind of away. I'm, pl- I'm pulled myself out of it. I'm going for a run. I'm just trying to be as in the moment as I can. And again, I think it's hard to do, but I think it's something that we need to do going forward. And the chance for me to continue. So what I'm saying is, while you're here, while we're here, see, look how feel something so cool. and pass it on. This song is, the song is for all of you guys. This song is for everything we've lost and everything we stand again in the future because the future is now and you guys are the future so have a call and stand for something really great speech by him man he, he, he absolutely smashed it i think he got a bit teary at the end i don't want to actually see that because it's gonna make me teary out too but yeah charles gambini was awesome again one of those performances that really puts a flag in the ground and really goes to um, go some way in terms of separating himself from the pack and I'm hoping that new album because he played quite a few new cuts I think I think they're new cuts I'm pro- hopefully not um, just some improv piece that he was doing um, with his uh, band and stuff jamming out but hopefully there's some new tracks that are going to debut very very soon but again it's going to happen again this weekend uh, two weekends in a row I'm not sure if they're going to do different shows or if they're going to mirror the same set this or whatever maybe but check it out it's on YouTube as well live stream the whole entire schedule there it's really easy to use you can just add your favorite you can just go through the schedule add the add, um, click, click to remind who you want to see and it'll send you a little notification if you get your notifications on on YouTube um, what else talking about oh talking about not being distracted and talking about fucking um, using your what do you call it? Um, not spending too much time on social media. I saw this amazing video <laughs> about morning routines, right? Because I, I went into a bit of a weird cave in terms of YouTube content the other day, looking at random videos when it comes to certain, you know, um, individuals, when it comes to some people in the makeup industry, some people in the um, commentary commentary scene, some people in makeup, whatever it may be called, right? I'm like looking through these things, looking at some of the drama stuff that's happening, you know, with all these sort of different um, personalities on it. And I stumbled across this amazing video of like um, that kind of um, that kind of uh, pits against these, you know, these idealistic, perfect looking uh, morning routines from these really attractive, um, uh, fit girls on YouTube with obviously Trita, Trisha Paytas, who's like the complete opposite of any sort of health um, wellness sound of mind right she's like a complete mess in that regard right both people like her i'm not really a fan but you know they're just you know like a normal human being if i'm not a fan i just don't watch it i don't end up going you know uh, berating somebody but it's a really good video because it kind of put pits them up to one and it kind of really goes to show like the unrealistic goals the unrealistic goals of these kind of you know top tier youtubers who are like you know smashing it and doing the best thing and the kind of trisha paytas who kind of you know probably um speaks for the normal everyday person on the street who kind of hopes they could be Hopes they could wake up at 5 a.m. and ends up waking up at 2 p.m., you know? But anyway, let me show you the video so you guys can see it. It's called Morning Routine, Every Girl on YouTube v. Trisha Paytas. I really recommend you check it out. I'll add a link to the show notes for you to see, but let's play it quickly and you can hear the video. Morning, as you can see, I get woken at about 8 a.m. by the sun shining through um, on my face, <laughs> which is really annoying <laughs> at the time, but it's really good because it gets me up. I wake up with greasy skin and crazy hair. <laughs> I don't go on social media because I feel like it's not good for me in the mornings. And I prop myself up to go through all my social medias, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. As soon as she wakes up, Trisha Paytas goes on social media. As soon as she wakes up, it's <laughs> completely opposite. <laughs> Patreon, you know the drill. Follow me at Trisha Paytas at any of those. Walk outside and pick a fresh lemon wow. from our lemon tree. Water and to take my day. I think she lives in Australia, right? She's got a fresh lemon tree in her garden. That's fucking awesome. Actually, that's really cool. Again, it was weird because some of the comments are like, oh, that's impossible. I have to have a lemon tree. No, it's just a fucking plant. You just put it in your garden. It's not that big of a deal. If you live somewhere with a, you know, with a, with a hot, sunny climate, why can't you have a tree in the back of your garden that bears lemons? It's not that big of a deal, really. I don't really get it. Um, 
I think people are just way too cynical on the internet. It's like it's not that big of a deal. It's just a plant. Yeah? Vitamins. And my 10 ounce coffee. This always gets me started in the morning. Coffee, and it's not a morning okay. routine unless I meditate. So I love doing guided meditations on nice Headspace. Meditation. And we love the reoccurring meditation candle. And what does Trisha Paytas do? Med- she the I candles. go to the bathroom do my business because I feel Obviously, like everybody does. She takes a shit in the morning because she just had a massive cup of coffee with nothing else to eat. So of course you're going to take a shit. Look at that face, man. Just, ugh. She's a mess. <laughs> this first thing in the morning. And I'm going to take the time to make myself a delicious and nutritious breakfast. It's sugar cereal, maybe not the best. But sugar cereal? Fucking hell, with a big my, glass of processed orange juice. juice, full fat milk, like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Has she even showered yet? Does she know, does she, does she, do we know if she showers? Does she just take a shit and change into her clothes? Jam. I also love adding almond milk and ice. Nice. And then I take some skin almond, milk. Almond and milk and ice. Eat my little meal. And while I'm having breakfast, I'll just use this time to check emails or check on my schedule. A is just watching YouTubes and eating. Give yourself a little bit of downtime to be creative. Donut. Just the other girls are writing out mood boards and storyboards and checking emails, writing down their calendar. And she's about to see a donut and checking her socials again. So in the mornings, I have actually been using my bullet journal. I use my colored pencils wow. and I just so plan out my day. That's so cool. Um, and then I will have some toast. Then I move on over to my whiteboard. You know, stuff like laundry, washing, things. Listen, I hate doing laundry, okay? And then I just finish up eating and kind of just take my time again. I was really having fun, really happy, really in a good mood. Nice. Then I just clean up just a little bit. I- but then it is time for me to go to Pilates. So I grab a banana and get changed. It is... So that, so that lady in the beginning, you said she wakes up at 5 a.m. with the sunlight hitting through her face. It was quite a good idea, right? I, I guess if you sleep with the curtains open, when, 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 if you sleep at normal time when the, when the sun sets, it would be quite dark. And then when you wake up, when you wake up in the morning, the sun would be kind of beaming through your window. So you'd be able to wake up quite quickly. It was the opposite of people that we use blackout blinds, right? To sleep, uh, deep sleep. And then they kind of just try and wake up with an alarm clock. So maybe it might be beneficial to do that. And then she, imagine, she doesn't have anything else in her stomach and just, which I do. I don't really work out with anything in my stomach, but she grabs a banana and goes to, it goes to those Pilates. It's my favorite thing to do in the world. Like I love it. Um, and then I eat workout. some more, and then I catch up on other shows like Glee. She eat some more. How does she eat it? It's just basically we at this point. Gets her face squeaky clean. I also love playing with my eyebrows. You know, just just a fun hobby of mine. So, and then you start looking like this. Then I love to shower. Shower time. She doesn't wash, Shower you know? time. Anything that smells like coconut is my favorite she thing. Wash. I use the caviar moisture shampoo and conditioner. I got the liters off of Amazon. It makes my skin really, really, she really, really soft. Then I like to use Q-tip my ears after shower because, you know, I'm in those ears. Okay. I'm going to brush my hair and part it in the middle and just sort of pull it all the way to the back, just brushing it all the way down. Nice. <laughs> I would just sit there and soak up the sun and just take a little bit of time to be really calm and relaxed. I and I actually like to think of things that I'm really grateful for. I think starting your day with a little bit of gratitude it will only lead to having a much more happy and really positive cool, day. I like them. I like them. But yeah, I recommend you check it out. It's really fucking funny. It's an awesome video. Um, it goes to show just how how different everyone's expectations are. But if anything, even though, you know, again, I'm not a fan of Trisha Pace, but I think, you know, for the most part, I think the audience will probably say they agree. They probably um, have more in common with the way Trisha kind of lives her life than maybe the average YouTuber on social. Oh, let's, take, let's pause this for a minute. I don't know what else playing there. Uh, save that. Um, but yeah, I think people probably agree more with uh, Trisha Paytas way of living than they probably do with these YouTubers who kind of look too perfect for the most part. And then I think last thing maybe we want to go through is TJ Dillashaw's apology, which I haven't seen yet. What? Well, let's maybe watch this live together. I haven't, I haven't actually seen what he says. But TJ Dillashaw, who unfortunately was banned for using EPOs, um, has been banned for two years, which essentially ruined, which essentially ended his career in the UFC for the most part. He probably have to go to another um, organization to fight after that. But um, uh, a lot of people have been coming to his defense, which is good to see because I think in general. I mentioned in the previous in my other video, I'm quite conflicted because, you know, I, again, I don't agree with cheating. I think cheating is, you know, is abhorrent. I think going into a, an octagon with somebody that's been using uh, performance-enhancing drugs is very dangerous because essentially they are 
able to last in if they're able to up their cardio or they're able to you know be a bit more explosive they could essentially um, leave you with life-altering injuries right and it's not something that anyone wants to see um but it, it, it it's obviously not it's obviously a bit naive to expect that these people performing at that higher level are not doing anything they're obviously doing something in order to kind of perform at that level we need to be aware of that um just, you know, the margins are so small. Uh, people's lives have changed so much. I think I mentioned before about Tyron Woodley saying how he's only just realised now how much uh, value the belt gave to his life. He's obviously not, you know, he's just not defining himself by it, but he's obviously very aware that a lot of opportunities that he got were only because he was champion. The moment he isn't champion, those phone calls stop. So I'm sure if you're TJ Dillashaw, that, um, that pursuit of trying to be the world's greatest, being a champ, champ, whatever it may be, can drive you maybe to do some, maybe some crazy and silly things. So anyway, TJ just sort of made an apology video, which is good because he hasn't said anything since. And since the kind of fallout, his coaches come out and distance themselves for him. Like, it's just been an absolute shit show of a whole performance. But I'm glad TJ just sort of came out and said something. So let's watch the video and see what he has to say. I messed up. Um, I have a hard time trying to forgive myself for this, which I should have a hard time. I should have a hard time forgiving myself. But I understand criticism and scrutiny coming my way. What I really feel bad about is uh, you kind of bad light and bring out my coaches, my family, my teammates. They had no involvement in this. I feel, I feel the worst for them. You know, um, I got a 15 month old son, and um, I want to be a role model for him. I'm sure there's a lot of other kids out there cool too. You know, so. But I got a man up to what I did. You know, I uh, accepted all penalties. I didn't try to fight this thing. Um, I'm going to sit for the next two years. What happened to his arm? Um, as of you know, January 18th, 2021, he's not allowed to come back. Um, the road to come back is uh, got shoulder surgery yesterday, my right shoulder. Uh, two months later, I'm getting my left one done. I had a uh, torn rotator cuff in the for the last two and a half years I've been dealing with. Oh, uh, yeah. It'd be nice to get those who love to come back. Uh, I've had people tell me I'd let this stuff die out. You know, let this thing die out for the next two years and just disappear. But, uh, I don't think that's the way I've done this thing. Exactly. It's a good thing you said that. Uh, at first, who gave, gave him that advice to let it die out? It's not ever going to die out if you don't say anything. It's, a, it's just going to keep building up. Every time people see you, they're going to start saying, "Oh, he didn't say nothing." But this just kills everything. This kills it because he came out. He's honest. He says, "I'm sorry. I fucked up. I made a mistake." And that's it. It's over. We just forgive it. We forgive him and let him go and let him kind of move on. And again, I think people are aware. They don't like when people cheat. It's not, but they know why they do it. Right? The margins are so small in any kind of professional sports. Like, the margins are so small for you to become, you know, from one minute, like, you, look what, look at Chris Weidman, for instance, right? He throws one leg kick and his whole career has changed forever, right? Like, it's just, you don't, like, you don't know what's going to happen next. You kind of have to, like, the things you have, to, and then you, again, imagine, right, you're fighting somebody that's in the top 10 or top 5 in whatever your weight class is. They're probably doing as much training or, or maybe more training than you are, so, right? They're doing as much as they physically can do to train dialed in diets, sleeping well, working out, loads of cardio, drilling, um, sparring, loads and loads of stuff. You're doing the same thing. And the only margin you have to really gain from it is maybe the use of performance enhancing drugs. Because essentially, you have to also admit that, you know, if you're talent, if you're not talented and you use performance enhancing drugs, it's not going to really do anything, right? It's not going to help you that much. But if you're at the top, if you're the top 1% fighters and you add a bit extra to you, you add, you add an EPO that allows you to, you know, have a gas tank for days, then I'm I'm not surprised that you're gonna be you're gonna be tempted to do it. I think people un understand it. I think for the most part, people are more understanding of that, especially when you come out and apologize. But let's continue what it says. Showing my son that when you make a mistake, face it, face it to his face, you know. Yeah, face it head on. True. Trust me, I'd love to run away and go hide in the cave for the next two years and mm. continue to grow up this this shitty beard. <laughs> Yeah, 
Damn, man. I just want to apologize to, uh, I've already apologized for my apologize to my fans, anyone I've let down, obviously my family, my coaches, my teammates. Yeah. Can't say sorry enough. There's something you're dealing with because of me. That's not enough. But, uh, this will be the end of me. I'll be back. That's good. Yeah. And I'm making you a promise now. I'm going to be back. I'll be back better. I'll be back stronger. Yeah. And I'll prove that, uh, <laughs> Better, stronger, and, and drug free. Oh, yeah. minutes, right? a bit, right? and, uh, work hard. Good to hear, man. Good to hear. But again, I'm so sad for him. He's holding back the tears, man. It's fucking sad to see him in this kind of way, man. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's sad to see him. It's sad to see him this way. I'm really, really sad to see him this way. But again, um, credit to credit to TJ for coming out and being honest, talking about it. I think for the most part, the MMA public will forgive him and will kind of move on because he was kind of a well-liked character in MMA for the most part. I think the out the backlash coming towards him is a little bit OTT. I get it because you know, from general, I don't like cheats. I don't think anyone likes cheaters. But I think we have to know, we have to understand just how fine these margins are, especially considering just how little these fucking guys are paid, especially the guys that aren't champion. It doesn't it doesn't surprise me that the ones that are trying to become champ champ, the ones that are trying to make history, are trying everything they can because that's where the big bucks are, right? They can't, be, you know, you can't necessarily earn good money being a top 20 fighter in the UFC. It doesn't really happen that way, unfortunately. It should be happening, but it doesn't. So they're having to go for, they're having to go for broke in terms of really trying to earn the big bucks. And sometimes going for broke, in some occasions, it means you wake up a bit earlier and you do seven runs in a day or some shit. But sometimes it means, you know, you might um, hit up the guy that was on the Icarus documentary and find out if you can take some um, foreign signs of drugs to help you out. It's sad, it's bad, but, you know, what can we do? So, um, credit to Tia did as well. Um, again, I think people will forgive him and move on. And you get, it gets time now to recover, have your surgeries, two years to kind of recalibrate and do things better again and hopefully come back. Um, hopefully we'll see him back again. It's going to be hard to do it at, at that age, but, you know, stranger things have happened and we all have a redemption story. Anyway, that's it. The Excellent Thing Show episode number 180. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have you in my company. I'm going to see you guys again later today or later tomorrow, in case whatever time you listen to it. Uh, but until then, if you have anything, want to check out what I'm up to, DJ gigs, um, the stuff that I do on the side, outside of my work life, or whatever it may be, check out my website, excellentzinger.com. If you're watching through YouTube, uh, click that like and subscribe button. Uh, smash that like and subscribe button if you have heard something I've spoken about and you think it was interesting, leave me a comment, let me know what your thoughts are so we can have a communication, we can be a community, a community, we can share this together. And until then, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Peace out.